Hey, this is Hunter with Lone Star Woodworking, and this month, I think I take on my most challenging build. I know I said that about the Mappa table, but I honestly think this one takes the cake. So this build was commissioned for a nine foot table by 40 inches wide and it started here at Algoa Millworks and I've talked about them a couple times in some past videos but I finally got around to filming just kind of the area and what they're all about. So this is a two man team with Corey being the owner and here you can see they've got all kinds of selections of stuff, mostly cedar and hackberry, mulberry, some really, really common uh, local stuff. But the big cookies right there are actually curly silver maple. We don't see that too often here, but I actually have a slab of that and I'm just waiting on someone to order a desk for it. That'll be an interesting video. And right there you can see that they're a pretty well-rounded couple of guys as far as woodworking goes. They'll do live edge slabs. They obviously are wood suppliers. They cut the wood, flatten the wood, and dry the wood. They'll build you some river tables, live edge tables. They even have some mantles back here, which is super cool. Um, I've only ever done two mantles in my woodworking career and I absolutely loved them. They were great. They were so much fun to work on. So if you're interested in a mantle, hit me up and we can get the ball rolling in here. Now, even though there was all this cool stuff here, the client wanted these two big pieces of hackberry. And this was kind of against my recommendations because these have a lot of rot in them. In fact, with that slab that I just put against the wall right there, you can see there's kind of like that black end at the top left of it. This other slab has it as well, and that's just rot. And it went about halfway down the slab, which kind of sucked because that meant that it was going to be incredibly difficult to work with. And here you can see I have to extend the form. And whenever I was playing around with the orientation of the slabs, I was trying to pick the best way to do this because I generally don't like to have the wood just kind of abruptly end in one spot. I like it to connect on both sides. So there you see, I'm trying to make it connect on both sides as the table is wide, if that makes sense. That was kind of a confusing statement, but I think you get what I'm trying to say. Well, the client came over and he kind of helped me pick out an orientation and it did not do this. In fact, it kind of had a more of a, a yin yang type of orientation to it where one of the rotted areas was facing towards the upper left and the other rotted area was facing towards the lower right or however you're looking at it. Basically, they just go in opposite directions, but they don't ever connect on the either on the other side. So there's pretty much an entire area that's just going to be epoxy. And that was concerning for me, and I'll get into that in just a minute. But because he wanted two of these slabs on totally opposite ends of this table, there was this big, wide open section, and he had done some research and saw that some people did islands. So I tried to recreate that. I really didn't like this idea. I didn't like the way this was going to look, but I tried to recreate it the best I can. I tried to follow the green so that it looked as natural as possible when I cut out these kind of weird shapes. Now this isn't anything special. You've seen a couple of creators on YouTube probably do this. I had to extend the melamine because it's only eight feet and this table is nine feet, as I said before. So I have to caulk the seam and tape it up. Now I know some people out there are kind of like, you know, really, really adamant on the form release. I've put out two videos where I use form release and both of them I had to kind of make a fool of myself and plane off the melamine and that's just a ton of extra work that I just really don't want to do. So I'm just using tape. It's really cheap, really easy to come by at Home Depot and I can make a 10 minute run there and be back home with everything that I need. Now the cleanup on these was actually very difficult because like I said, they were really, really soft and I didn't want to scar or mar the wood in a way where it, as I plane it down, I wouldn't be able to, to fix it. But on top of that, with it just being super soft, this dirt in here was as hard as a rock. Not that part that I'm doing now. That part actually has like some fuzzy grain to it because it's super rotted. 
but these over here, these were really, really hard patches of dirt that I had to get out, and I don't really know what causes that. I just know it was very difficult to clean out. But after I got them cleaned out, I started setting everything in the form, and this is what I kind of meant by that yin-yang. The, you know, one end of rod is going the other way, the other is going the other way, and then I have to cut out these islands. And at this point, I was pretty dead set on the fact that I hated this idea. These islands didn't look good. They didn't flow well. They didn't mesh well with anything. It, you know, you're trying to recreate a live edge and it's just never going to look natural. So I really, really tried to convince him out of this so that he wouldn't waste my time or his money, but we ended up trying it anyway and wasted both. So what he actually did is ended up buying a really small, pretty much just a stick of hackberry to kind of fill in that area, and it ended up working out okay. You'll see that here in just a second. Other than that, what we were pretty much facing at this point is that an entire side of the table was going to be blue epoxy. So I said, hey, we should fill in some of these corners, and he said, cool. So that's what I did, and this is that piece that I was talking about. And because we're going with kind of a translucent blue, which I really tried talking him out of, and not for any other reason other than I don't like translucent colors, and also you're going to see everything underneath it being the hardware. And we're going to talk about that in a minute too. <laughs> so what he wanted was to have a piece that kind of looked like it was rising out of water, almost oceanic, and I thought, okay, you know, that's a pretty cool idea. I can do that. That's simple enough. And by the end of it, this is the orientation that we had. And you can kind of see right here, pretty much, starting right here where this piece is at, all of that going all the way to the rest of the table is nothing but epoxy. And that's a big problem because epoxy doesn't behave like wood. Wood, in my opinion, is a whole lot more predictable, whereas epoxy is basically plastic and is a lot more prone to extreme issues when it comes to temperature fluctuations and things like that. Whereas with wood, temperature fluctuations are going to be a small issue, but you mostly have to worry about moisture. And if you can seal it up with either finish or epoxy or whatever it is, usually you can mitigate that, and I'm going to say solid 85%. Now, I was talking about how because this is a translucent blue, you'll be able to see all of the hardware underneath this table. Well, the client wanted to come over for the epoxy pour so that way he could see just how blue the epoxy was and bless it off so that way we both know that he got exactly what he wanted, which is why I'm using that cup. It's about two inches deep and the table is going to end about two inches thick, so you get a pretty good idea of what the epoxy is going to look at when it's done, look like when it's done. When I mentioned the fact that he was going to see all the hardware through this translucent blue, he kind of got a concerned look. And then I got concerned because I kind of had a good idea of what he was going to say. He said, well, I don't really want to, to see any of the hardware. I want a nice, clean look. And I said, okay. Well, sir, that's kind of difficult because this is just how these tables are built. This is what keeps them stable. It's what keeps them flat and it's what keeps us from having any issues in the future. And he said, well, what if I just uh, commission someone to build a base that is substantial enough to do this? So I said, that's perfectly fine, but he needs to be done by the time I'm done so that this thing doesn't warp or twist or anything like that. Well, the guy building the base didn't get done in time, and we'll talk about that at the end because I got a text from the client that's not all that great. So I waited about three, two or three weeks before I busted this thing out of the form, and I think it's because I had other stuff going on uh, with my work. I was having to travel a lot. And here's just kind of something fun, or at least I think it'll be fun. There's a lot that changes in my shop from the time this video starts to the time that it ends. So just for those of you that are a little bit more observant and actually watch my videos, I would be really curious to see how many things you can identify that change throughout the course of this video, because there are quite a few. But anyway, busting this thing out of the form went very, very well. Again, coating it in tape, I usually don't have any kind of concern. My only concern was that this is a really big table. In fact, it's the biggest table I've ever done personally. 
So I was a little concerned about certain things, especially with mostly how heavy it was and how difficult that was going to be to move around. But even though I'm a one-man shop, I got it done. As you can see here, it just took a little bit of shimmying and we got it all out. From there, I started moving on to the flattening. Now, the issue that I ran into here is that my workbench, the actual surface for it is only six feet by three feet, but I just screw a couple of four feet by eight feet pieces of plywood there, but this is a 40 inch by nine foot table. So it did have some overhang and it caused my workbench to sag. So there was quite a bit of corrections and issues that I was running into. This isn't from my workbench. This is actually because the epoxy had pulled the wood up and this thing was so heavy I couldn't drag my workbench out into the sun. So I actually had to sit here and bridge clamp it. And there you can see just how flexible that plywood is and how concerning that was for me as I try to flatten this thing out. But like I said, I bridge clamped it and I think I left it there for about a week. It was supposed to be warming up because most of the time throughout this build it was cold. Uh, so I was hoping that with the heat, the epoxy would kind of relax and let the wood and everything just kind of settle back down flat. After about a week, it was flat enough, not necessarily totally flat, but flat enough for me to at least start flattening it out. So I shouldn't have done this. I, with how big this table was and how awkward this was, I shouldn't have done this because with how wide it is, I couldn't really gauge how much pressure I was putting down on my router whenever I was going across the wood and it ended up biting into the epoxy in the wood really, really hard a couple of times, and that lent itself to just some imperfections. You can see some of the rings right there where the bit was spinning, and that kind of happened all over, especially on the edges where, you know, that's kind of the most visible part, which was super frustrating for me. And I'm actually in the middle of a build right now. If you follow me on social media, you know what I'm talking about, where I'm flattening it at Algoa Millworks now. I'm done trying to flatten these things and having it come out really crappy. I think I'll flatten my own slabs from now on if I have to, but you know what? Why put in this much work for a worse finish just to kind of say, hey, I do it myself? But I'd be curious what you all think. Do I kind of lose the credibility as the, you know, the quote everyman for you know, a one man shop where everything I do shows that you can be capable of doing it too? Or am I just, you know, someone who has a resource available at their disposal and I'm using it? All right, while you mull over that question, and I'm sure some of you will leave me an answer in the comments, I went ahead and started on the finished sanding for the bottom. This wasn't terribly difficult. I sanded it up to 320 and just flipped it over. I mean, there was really no big deal to it. It was relatively easy, which is not something that I say lightly. Now, I was hoping that he would let me, the client would let me put a chamfer on this just so I can kind of hide that epoxy edge, but he wanted it to stay as square as possible. So I kind of had to deal with just putting the round over on there, but with the way I sanded it, this actually ended up looking just fine. Now, if you saw me flip this thing over and you were a little bit more observant, you saw that there were a few spots where the epoxy did not get flattened out quite well. And that's because it was really, really low. And you know, in a table this big and on my workbench, I couldn't level this thing out perfectly. So there were quite a few low spots such as these. And I figured like, okay, I can just fill them in with some tabletop epoxy, no big deal. Well, it was a big deal. But before I did that, I was like, oh, well, you know, this is like a whole quarter inch. I don't know if I really wanna fill that in, but I think I ended up going ahead and doing that anyway. Cause yeah, that's a pretty big gap. And then before I could even move on to any idea, I noticed that the warp had come back. So what I ended up having to do is flip it back over and flatten out that spot. You can kind of see it from here that it is a little bit uneven. So I had to end up doing this anyway.
After that was taken care of, I went ahead and finished sanded the bottom yet again, and then flipped it back over and started filling in all of the major imperfections on the top, as well as filling in all of the low spots with this tabletop epoxy. Now, this is where I need to give you a word of caution on mixing up tabletop epoxy when it's cold, or at least when you're mixing up tabletop epoxy cold, when the actual components of it are cold. So it did not cure all the way, so it's nice and squishy, which I obviously can't leave on the table. But on top of that, it's just this weird layer of clear, and I obviously didn't pop hardly any of the bubbles. So that obviously could not stay. And there you can see it's a solid quarter inch. So I have to take off that quarter inch that I was trying to avoid taking off anyway, which really, really sucked. That was kind of disheartening. At this point, I was starting to get really, really nervous with this project because I was thinking to myself, like, okay, is this going to be a success? Am I going to have to call the client and say, I screwed this up too much and we got to start over? Because that's a call no woodworker want to make. In fact, I'm going to say it's a call that no maker wants to make, period. I don't care if you make jewelry, furniture, freaking the little seashell things. I, I'm sure some of you know what I'm talking about. Either way, nobody wants to make that call. Luckily, even though it's at an inch and a half thick, because he doesn't want me to put C-channels in the bottom of it, I think I can still salvage it. My only issue is that it, with, with it being this thin, it is more prone to warping. It doesn't have as much material to move as that moisture either absorbs or if the epoxy heats up or anything like that. So my idea was to give it a flood coat, or not really a flood coat, a seal coat of epoxy, and this will do two things. One, this will harden up the, uh, the, the rotted wood because this was all still super soft and very, very brittle. But it'll also seal everything up with the exception of the epoxy river, but it'll seal up the wood so I don't have to worry about moisture absorption or anything like that. From there, I mean, it was sanding. I put the round over on and put the, the final sanding grid on. I can't remember if I went up to 320 or 400 with this one. I think he wanted almost like this glass smooth feel. So I think I went up to 400 on it. And from here, it was by far the most nerve wracking portion of this table build. And you would think that's any other portion other than the finish, but nope. The finishing is what made me the most nervous because I knew that as soon as I put this finish on, if something was jacked up with the river, if something was jacked up with the wood, it was going to come out right now and I was going to have to start pretty much from square one. After finishing the bottom, everything looked fine and I was relatively satisfied with it. I'm not terribly happy with the project as a whole, but as far as the process of making it and how things should look, I was pretty happy with this. So there you can see that clear pour that I had to make there turned out fine. The wood actually does look pretty cool. You can see down into the rot, which is kind of what the client was looking for. It's translucent, so you can kind of see through it. The sheen is nice and even, and I was pretty happy with this. Now you thought that just because I finished the table that the video was over, didn't you? Nope, this guy added something else about halfway through this. He wanted a beam in the center of his table base. So I don't know if anybody has seen that, and for some reason I didn't put an example of it. I'm sure you can find an example of a table base with a wood beam in the center of it. They're everywhere. And he wanted it made out of the same stuff, Hackberry, which I started kind of groaning at at first because I'm pretty tired of working with this wood. It's super soft, super punky, and really just annoying to work with. And it stinks. Oh my God, it smells so bad. But here you can see that it just had so many different issues with it that I ended up putting these bow ties in it. And these bow ties do not serve any kind of aesthetic purpose other than, yeah, cool, bow ties look good. These bow ties are actually functional because there were cracks and little dings and checks all over this beam and I really didn't want this thing separating down the line. So I put these bow ties in. Granted, these probably aren't the strongest. This is the Slab Stitcher Slimline bow tie. I um, mean, you use this little jig, they have everything that comes with it. 
they're really, really thin. And I actually don't think that they're going to serve a great structural purpose, but I put like three or four along each crack. There's 13 total bow ties in this thing. So I think that the combined effort of all those bow ties on one crack will keep it from separating for the most part. And then on top of that, they were filled with epoxy as well. I hope you guys can appreciate the amount of effort that went into getting this shot. I had to put my phone in front of me and really try to just work around it. I basically used it as a magnifying glass, so it worked out for me in the end. And from here, you can see that it goes in nice and tight and super easy. From there, it was just a matter of applying the rest of them. And this took me, eh, probably 20 minutes. Again, this jig makes really, really fast work of it. From there, it was just sanding this thing all the way up to 320 like I did on the table. Did I need to go up that high for a beam that's going to go under the table? No. But, you know, it's a nice looking table regardless, and I would still want every part of it to look just as good as anything else. Now, I told you that the client gave me a call or texted me about... Um, the table because it's actually sitting in a barn right now because the guy who's making the base because he screwed up and because he's having to take forever now he decided that he was just going to come get it and take it to his barn and keep it so that way it would get out of my way and i could continue on with other projects well the client called me and said hey uh this table's got a warp and i said yeah you know you didn't want any c channels or stabilizing hardware in the bottom of it so that's not terribly surprising it's also in a barn you know, it gets hot in there, it gets cold in there, the epoxy's probably shrinking and expanding. And he said, well, is it going to stay there? And I said, I don't know. Um, we'll see what the base looks like and see if we can actually clamp it out. He's like, okay, well, the base is substantial, so I would hope so. And I said, I hope so too. So stay tuned for that on my social media and I'll let you guys know how this went. But that's actually going to do it for the video, guys. I hope you learned something. I hope you enjoyed, and I hope to see you next time. And as always, if you want to see more videos like this, please subscribe.